Amen. God bless you all. Well, after the service, we're going to have an opportunity, and just to give you a heads up, we're going to do an offering for Michael Mack. He travels full time, and I will tell you that it's a faith walk to do this, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll have an opportunity for you to bless him in his ministry. He goes wherever God leads him to go. And I believe this morning's message, if you're going to do the same one, please, mm -hmm. right? Is the is a, t a timely message for the world, especially America, and for New Hope today. It's a timely message. I want you to put your hands together and welcome my friend and some of our own friends, Micah McDonald. In short, Micah Mac. <laughs> Love you, Micah. Love you. God bless you. you. Oh, were you going to give me a hug? I was going to oh, give I you was a hug. Reject yeah. I was rejecting you, bro. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> hey, I want to thank Pastor and the team here. You know. New Hope Church, uh, it's really a second home. It feels that way for us. Uh, I'm surprised we're not on staff yet. Uh, it's just, I, you know, I, it, it literally feels like home. I feel like I'm coming to home. And so thank you, Pastor, for having me come. And you guys have a great staff here, a great team here. Can we give it up for our leadership of the church? You guys really are blessed. You really are blessed. My grandfather was in a uh, fighter pilot in World War II. He flew a P-38. Uh, uh, my grandfather actually was an ace pilot, shot down over five uh, en enemy planes. My grandfather had 11 children, had a picture up on the dash of the plane of his wife and his kids when he would fly in the air. And um, uh, about a couple months before D-Day, my grandfather's in combat in the air with another plane. And my grandfather's plane gets shot down to where he has to do a dead stick landing. There's no motors in the plane, no engine whatsoever. My grandpa being above uh, um, the earth, looking down on it, trying to find the best place to land. The enemy overpasses him, knowing that they're shooting down the plane. And my grandpa, as he's looking at the family pictures, thinking this is it, this is the end of my life. And my grandpa successfully... Uh, does a dead stick landing, and right when he lands, my grandfather's head goes boom, right on the, on the dash there of the plane. A big gash is opened up on my grandfather's head. He was knocked out for a while, was concussed. When he woke up, there was blood all over. He gets out of the plane, and he had a gun, some personal belongings, and his first thought was, the Germans saw me land. They know that there wasn't an explosion, so they're going to come looking for me. His very first thought was to find the nearest um, creek, river, something he could to hide his possessions, hide his gun, hide his belongings, because his thought was, if the Germans find me and they see me pull out a gun, I'm dead. I'm killed. So he hides his belongings, hides his guns in a river, and sure enough, a commander and his troops went on the lookout for my grandfather. They found him laying in a creek, and my grandfather shares a story where he comes over to him, the German commander comes over to him, puts his hand on my grandfather, and he says this, for you, the war is over. For you, the war is over. My grandpa became a prisoner of war, and a few months later was released on D-Day, and has lived to tell the story. He's been on the History Channel. And today is Memorial Day, or coming up is Memorial Day, a Memorial Weekend. And before we started in today's message, I wanted to pay honor to everyone who has fallen, or to everyone who served in our country, or is serving today. Can we honor them by applauding them and thanking them? Thank you for your service. We honor you today. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for leading the way. Thank you for your bravery and commitment. As Pastor mentioned, my wife and I, we travel full time on the road. I bought a picture of my wife. This is a picture of my wife, Steph. We met at North Central University in downtown Minneapolis. And I don't know how I got her, but I did, okay? I don't know what she saw me, but she saw something. And we've been married now for seven years. And uh, we have two children. You can put up the next picture. Uh, that's our two kids there. Everly is a two and a half year old girl. And Malachi is now nine months old. We were in the local church as youth pastors. And for five years, my wife was a worship pastor. We felt God tell us to go and be obedient. And it was scary because we went from a full-time job with benefits, salary, and then leaving all of that to zero dollars. And if you don't preach, you don't eat kind of a thing. But um, we have been uh, really blessed in our journeys and in our travels. In the last year and a half, we've seen close to 3,000 people give their life to Christ for the first time. Uh, we've, you can clap for that. That's incredible. Um, we've watched God do the miraculous. 
And the reason why I'm telling you all this and giving you a report is because I feel like I'm here four to seven times a year ministering to your youth or to the families here, and I want you to feel like you're a part of the ministry that we get to do. And so one of our prayers is, God, make it permanent. Let it not just be an encounter. Let it not just be a momentary thing. God, let the work of the Spirit that takes place in every single heart be a permanent one, one that lives out on the daily life, one that's transformative. And so this summer, we're praying that prayer as we are gone for nine weeks this summer. We're doing nine summer camps all over the country, as far as Texas, Oklahoma, Quebec, Massachusetts. We're kind of going all over the place, and our prayer is, God, make it permanent in this next generation's heart. Make it a daily thing. May it be a transformative formative thing in their life. And I wanted to share a couple stories just so you can be keyed in on what God's doing. I got a message a year ago in the summertime after a camp from a student, and the student on July 15th said this. She said, Micah, before you came and spoke, I was struggling with a life of drugs. I was trying to hide the pain that I had so I didn't have to face the people that hurt me. I knew God had an amazing plan for my life, but I was too hurt to follow it. I was able to give that up to Jesus this last week at camp. Thank you so much for coming and sharing. And by the way, I've started a prayer room in my house. Every morning I ask God to continue to deliver me from the addictions and struggles that I face. That was July 15th of last year. I got a message just a month ago from this girl. When you get messages from kids, they're coming off a really great moment at camp and it feels good, but you don't really know how they're doing the rest of the year. I just got this message a month ago. One of the things that's put on our hearts to do in our ministry is to challenge people to start a prayer room in their house. My wife and I did that, and it's radically transformed us. We've watched how God has used it as a springboard into what we're doing now, and we feel called to lead this next generation into intimacy with Christ through learning what it means, what Jesus says, and how to pray in Matthew 6. Shut the door in your bedroom, pray and seek my Father, and what your Father sees you doing in secret, he will reward you for it. The reward is always Christ. It's always Jesus. It's always what he has planned for you, his fruit and his life. I got this message about three weeks ago from the same student. She says this, it's been almost a year since camp, and my life has turned around so much. My prayer room has had to get bigger because I needed more space for Jesus. I got a calling from God to be a missionary to Vietnam, which was also said through four different prophetic words. I am bringing people from my school to church. I'm spreading the gospel everywhere I go. God has been orchestrating this for so long. I can't imagine what would have happened had I not chosen to spend time with Jesus. Thank you so much. It's crazy to me how God can take a girl, a teenager addicted in drugs, struggling with drugs because of the hurts in her life, and now being called onto the mission field to Vietnam and is now going on her first missions trip this summer to Vietnam. That's the power of our God. I brought another picture of a girl. I don't know if we have that, uh, that girl. I spoke at a camp last summer. She comes up to me at this camp and she goes, Micah, she goes, it's weird being here. And I say, well, why is that? She goes, well, this is a Christian camp. And I was thinking to myself, you know, didn't you read the form that you, you know, did you not, I'm trying to find the disconnect. And she goes, no, like I'm a, I'm a Jew. I'm a, come from a Jewish home. I'm a Jew. I'm not a Christian. So this is weird for me to be. I don't even know why I'm here. I said, hey, I'm really glad you're here, Yana. Why don't you just like see what God will do? Be open. Well, that night during the message, I gave a clear presentation of the gospel. She was the very first one to pop up out of her seat, come down to the front and receive Christ as the Messiah who came to save her and every person in this world. She came to me the next day. She had a tired look on her face to say, hey, you know, how you doing? She goes, you know, I'm doing all right. She goes, I've had insomnia for the last several years, and I can't sleep. I have a sleeping disorder, and I've never been able to sleep. And I just felt like the Holy Spirit nudged me in my heart saying, Mike, I'm going to take care of this. And so I said, hey, you know how you surrendered your life to Christ last night? She goes, yeah. I said, that same Savior who saved you last night is the same Savior that's going to heal your insomnia 
and tonight you're going to get the best sleep of your life. And she was like, what, that's possible? Like, that can happen? I said, yeah. I said, let's pray. And so we prayed that she be delivered and free of insomnia. And that night, the very next morning, she comes running to me. She goes, Micah, I got the best sleep of my entire life. I've never slept that hard before. And night after night after night, she was getting the best sleep. God only know, not only saved this girl and revealed himself to her, but he also healed her. It's powerful. You know, uh, one of the things that's on my wife and I's heart in our ministry and what we get to do is to raise a monthly support just like a missionary would, like a missionary would have to. And the whole reason why we want to do that is so we can take all of our love offerings, all of our honorariums that come into our ministry, and give it 100% back onto the mission field to missionaries to make it all about the go. So wherever we go and preach, praise God. God's doing cool things, but what people don't know is the money we get from churches or wherever we go, we don't see any of that money. That money goes back on the mission field to see more people reach for Christ. That's the heartbeat of our ministry. That's the heartbeat of what we get to do. And I thank you for this church for allowing us to come and be so active to minister here. You know what's one of the most heartbreaking things for me? And I get to see a lot of this because I get to go a lot of different churches and meet a lot of different people. It's the people that had a powerful experience with Jesus at some point Maybe it was an encounter. Maybe it was a healing that took place. Maybe it was receiving his grace or encountering his presence for the first time. But what really breaks my heart is seeing people have those moments, but letting it be just a moment and never actually following Jesus. It breaks my heart that we can experience the supernatural. We can experience the miraculous, but yet never actually follow the person who did it in our life. Another thing that breaks my heart are the people that may be in the room here today where you've grown up in the church. The moment you were born, you were dedicated in the church. All you remember is maybe the Sunday school and the different things growing up in the church. But yet it's like your life is based on what you do versus what he's done for you. It's almost as if your life is lived from a perspective of legalism or rules or trying to keep a certain way or checking things off. And it's possible that people can spend their entire lifetime completely missing out on the presence of God, on the presence of Jesus, because we are so self-consumed with us and our religion. Today's text where I want to lead you to comes from John chapter 5. And if you brought your Bibles, we're going to be looking at 16 verses today. I've never preached this message anywhere else. This is a message I felt like God put on my heart for this church for this time right now. It's John chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. And something you need to understand about this text is before we even jump into the text in John chapter 5, is Jesus was just in the Galilee area for a while doing ministry. If you know anything about Israel or you don't, that's okay. Galilee was in the north part of Israel. Jerusalem was in the southern part of Israel. It was quite a journey to walk to and from. But Jesus spent most of his ministry in Galilee, out of the three years that he ministered from age 30 to 33 is what they believe. Those three years of ministry, most of those years were spent on the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee is not actually a salt-bodied water. It's not an ocean. It's a lake, a freshwater lake. In fact, a unique note about the Sea of Galilee is the water from the Sea of Galilee flows up from the mountains down, all the way down into the Dead Sea, the lowest uh, body of water on the planet of Earth. Okay, it's called the Dead Sea. And so Jesus spends most of his ministry up there. But when we get to John chapter 5, we see Jesus actually ends up in Jerusalem for a big feast that's going on. If you were a Jewish person or called yourself a Jew, a couple times a year you would travel to Jerusalem to be a part of the festivals, to be a part of the rituals and some of the laws that were there for the people to celebrate, commemorate, and remember what God had done for the Israelites. So Jesus finds himself in John chapter 5 being there. In verse 1 it says, Sometime later Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. By the way, I happened to see the pool of Bethesda when I went to Israel just this last spring. And if you ever, if you ever get the opportunity to go to Israel, or someone presents an opportunity for you to go to Israel, Israel and archaeological digs literally prove the existence of God's scripture and his protection of scripture. 
you open up your Bible, you walk the places that Jesus walked, you walk the southern, temp- the southern steps of the temple, you see the pool of Bethesda, you see the pool of Shalom, you see these places where Jesus walked, and the Bible comes to life. It's incredible. I say it like this. There was a man in his 80s where he dreamt to go to Israel. He finally got to Israel in his old age, and when he gets there, he begins to weep and begins to cry. And his friend said, why are you crying? What's the big deal? And he said, I wish I would have done this when I was younger. I wish I could have seen all of this when I was young in my faith. I wish I could have witnessed this. And so the pool of Bethesda, they know for sure, is one of the spots where a miracle took place. And here, Jesus shows up to this pool, and it says in verse 3, there was a great number of disabled people that used to lie there, the blind, the lame, they're paralyzed. And so you have this group of people that are living there. In verse 5 it says, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked the man, do you want to get well? Verse 7, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. If you're taking notes today, I want to lead you to your first point. Your first point being this, is Jesus loves to find the broken you, and he loves to heal you. He loves to find the broken you, and he loves to heal you. What I love about this text here in John chapter 5 is in a lot of other areas of Scripture, you see people in their desperation trying to locate Jesus because the narrative of the narrative of Jesus is that he's a healer. He heals people. In fact, Matthew 4 says that every person that came in contact with Jesus was healed. So the word travels fast because disease was everywhere. There are people that were sick. If they could just get to Jesus, if they could just touch Jesus' cloak. And out of their desperation, people would do everything and anything to get to him. And you want to know what I love about this text right here? Is this man doesn't know who Jesus is when he comes up. But this right here reveals the very character and nature of Jesus. And it's this, that he loves to find broken people and heal them. And by the way, this right here is a hope for somebody in the room. This right here is the feel-good part of the message. It's the feel-good part of the story in that this... While you and I were enemies of Jesus, while you and I were yet sinners, messed up, jacked up, broken, addicted, while you and I were far away from Jesus, undeserving of his grace and undeserving of his mercy, God chose his one and only son to die on a cross for you because of his love to go and find you. It was a bunch of people, a broken people that existed in the world and still exist in the world today. And this text right here in John chapter 5 of Jesus finding a man for 38 years with a crippling disease to where he can't get healed decides to go and find him and bring healing to his brokenness. Anybody in the room addicted? Anybody in the room can't get away from what you're facing? Anybody in the room can't break free, feel like it's the same thing over and over? Anybody in the room desperately need a miracle? Jesus can take 38 years of brokenness, 38 years of being an outcast, and flip it within one moment. That's the power of our God and who God is and what he loves to do in his creation. He loves to redeem the broken things of your past, of your present. I don't care what your problem is. I don't care what you came in with. I don't care if you're hooked on drugs right now or if you're hungover from the night before. Christ can meet you, desires to find you, and he desires to heal you and never leave you the same. And know what's amazing about God? This story right here reveals the character and nature of Jesus in that Jesus is good. That he is good. Did this man deserve it? I don't know. But know what's crazy to me? is that there was a spot, like a hangout spot, for the people that weren't accepted in society. They weren't allowed into the temple because they were unclean. Some of them were cut off from their families. Can you imagine having a child that's paralyzed? Can you imagine having a child that has autism? Some of you maybe have that in the room. And then you looking at your child and say, you're dirty, you're unclean. Hey, you're old enough now. Why don't you see you later? Can't come, can't come to church with us can't be here, you take care of yourself. Do you realize that was some of the rules and laws that were set up for the Jewish people? Are we surprised that there's lame lame people, blind people, paralyzed people, sick people all together? No. And you want to know what's really sad about this story? Because the truth is still today the same. 
a bunch of people were gathering together at a pool thinking that a pool could magically heal them. There was this ideology floating out there that if you could just dip in the pool, then you'd be healed at a certain time. How many people in the world today still live and give their entire life for something false? For something that's not true, for something that won't change them, for something that won't last. But could it be that out of people's desperation, they don't know the truth because they've never heard? Could it be people that don't know that there's a healer named Jesus who came to seek and save them because no one's told them? Could it be that they don't know there's another way and so to us it looks foolish, but to God he's saying, I'm just looking for an advocate. I'm just looking for someone to go into the places that people don't want to go. I'm looking for people to go into the downcast areas, the people who are cut off from society to go and make a difference and bring my heaven and bring my light into those areas and places. Some of us think we found Christ. The reality is, is Christ found you. And Christ loved you and chose you first. You and I are so undeserving of the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. But Christ constantly demonstrated how he found us, how he chose us, and how he heals us. You know what's crazy to me is that for 38 years, this man was struggling with this. And when Jesus looks at him, when Jesus hears his condition, he goes up to the man and he says this, do you want to get well? He asks the man a question. The reason why I think this question is important is because a lot of us may want to get well, but we actually don't want to get well. Like we actually don't want to do the hard thing. We actually don't want to have to cut out certain things in our life. And Jesus is still asking the question. He asked the man, the man thinks, oh my word, someone's going to deliver me into the pool. The man didn't realize who was standing in front of him. The man didn't realize the miracle worker, the power of a savior of the universe that was going to heal him in just a moment. The man associated his healing to the pool and someone bring him over there. And for 38 years, he's been in that spot. I think we all need to seriously take that question into consideration because how many of you know faith without works is dead? Which means this, does Jesus forgive you and cleanse you of all your sins? Yes. But does that mean that you might now need to cut things out of your life? Stop watching certain things that you've been watching? Stop reading certain things you've been reading? Start, start something new in your life? Yes. Because the steps to freedom is found in Christ, but to remain in Christ is a process of surrendering to his will over your life. Him being Lord of your life. You know what's crazy? And this is kind of sad. Is a lot of us, when we hear that point, we get really excited. Oh yeah, that's right. Jesus can heal. Jesus can set me free. That's right. His gospel came to seek and save me and find me. It's a really good message to preach. But this in all reality is a really, part, a really sad part of the story. And a lot of us, when we preach this text, we'll just preach those first eight and nine verses, but we actually don't get the full picture of what's really going on here in the story. In one moment, Christ parallels and foreshadows what he came to do, which is to step into places and areas in darkness and bring his light to save people. But in the very next moment, it contrasts with the oppressive religious system that was in the world at that time and can still be oppressive today if we let it creep in over our lives. At one moment, Jesus came to show what he came to do, and in the very next moment, the religious leaders, the Pharisees of the day, they encounter this man, and now they add burdens onto him rather than celebrating with his healing and with his deliverance. What it says in verse 8, it says, Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat, and he walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. Now, when you read that in Scripture, you're like, oh, that's not a big deal. You know, it's a Sabbath day. Sabbath day was a day of rest. God created it. God designed it. But this was different. The religious leaders on Sabbath day actually made it a miserable and oppressive day for Jews. It was never enjoyable. It was never life-giving. It was never restful. It was never uplifting. It was never restorative. The religious leaders of the day took what God intended, put their own man-made laws on it, and made it oppressive for the people so that their religious system could be celebrated and be exalted. In turn, it kept a whole bunch of people in bondage. And if you're taking notes today, your second point is this, is religious people will guard their preferences in exchange for his presence. Religious people will guard their preferences in exchange for his presence. It's, 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 it's as if like, oh, that doesn't work with me. No, 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 that doesn't work with me. And what ends up happening is God's presence is squelched. 
Can you imagine this? This man of 38 years being free, being delivered. He can finally walk. The thoughts of getting his normal life back. The thoughts of being able to go to the temple. The thoughts of seeing his family again. The exciting things that a miracle would have meant for this man sitting at a pool is encountered by the Pharisees. And it says, when they saw him on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders said to the man, it is the Sabbath and the law forbids you to carry your mat. It's like all joy that this man would have ever felt, all grace and mercy that he would have encountered goes out the window when the very first thing said by the Pharisees is, hey you, what are you doing carrying your mat? It's the Sabbath. And by the way, you wanna know how jacked up this really is? The Pharisees thought they were doing a service unto God by telling this man to put his mat away. So much so that the Pharisees valued their preferences over people. God, help us from ever getting to a point where we value our preferences over people. Because you want to know what a religious spirit does? It drowns out the voice of the Holy Spirit. It quelches the move of the Spirit. It quelches the voice and revival that God loves to bring into people's minds and bring into people's hearts. It's like having a neighbor next door and you know them as the drunk, or you know them for the parties that they do, and you look at them, ah, oh, those people, I wish they'd just be quiet, I wish they'd just shut up. You call the police on them, all those kinds of things. And then all of a sudden they come to church without you knowing and they get their life radically transformed, and yet you still treat them the same way as though they're the drunk and you see them through your preferences over them as people. God, help us and keep us from our preferences. Some of you might be thinking, well, I don't have preferences. Let me give you some preferences that we might say. Oh, I don't really like what the preacher is wearing today. I don't really like how he's dressed. Because he's dressed that way, I don't want to hear him. You may be missing out on the breakthrough you potentially need because of your preference of an outward individual communicating the word of God. Preference number two, oh, I don't like that worship music they're playing. That really doesn't resonate with me. Is it lifting up the name of Jesus? Is it glorifying God? Then find a way to put aside your preferences and worship God for who he is. Number three, oh, I don't really care for those youth pastors, those Pastor Zach and Luke. They're, I don't really, that Luke, he needs to shave that beard, that guy. He need to get rid of that thing. I don't really care for them. Someone saying amen to the beard loss. I get it, I get it. You gotta lay aside your preferences. Let him be Luke. Sometimes it does take, though, an elderly man to come up and be like, son, I bought you a razor. Here you go. I'm gonna help you out. You know, I'm gonna take care of you. Sometimes, sometimes it helps, but it depends on the spirit. Another one. Oh, I don't really like how things are done around here. Oh, when did it become your church? When did it become you or about you? When did it become about your preferences? The last I checked, Christ came to seek and save the lost. We got to lay aside our preferences and get on board with the mission of Christ. God, break our hearts again for the things that stir your heart and what you came to do. We get into a really dangerous spot when we start vocalizing, the, oh, I don't really like this coffee. It's not that good. Should have gone to Frederick's or Starbucks this morning instead. I knew I should have done it. Are you filling the blank? Or how about this? oh, wow, I can't believe she wore that in church today. I wonder how many men she's going to get to stumble. When you don't know that someone from this church invited her, and the night before she was prostituting herself, and she's here to hear the message of grace, and there you are with your preferences judging her. It squelches the heart of God for 38 years. 38 years, this man had been imprisoned by his disease. It was his identity. And in one moment, mercy meets him, and the very next moment, the religious leaders squelch him. They put barriers on him. They put expectations on him. They bind him up with their law and their words. This story, in all reality, as much grace is found in the beginning of it, is a warning and a sign to what happens when religion rules your mind versus Christ transforming your mind. You're either a person of God's presence or you're a person about your preference, but you cannot be both. Don't allow the presence of God to be squelched from your life because your preferences are in the way. Jesus came to establish something new 
and his new was this. God, I love you with all my heart. I'm only going to do what I see the Father doing. God, I love you and I love every single person. God, the religious leaders tick me off because they're leading people astray, but I love the religious leaders too. This was the heart of Jesus. As I was preparing for this message to preach, there was a worship song I couldn't get out of my head during this whole time I was preparing. I'm going to sing it a little bit. I'm a horrible singer, but here's how the song goes. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. Oh, it's all about you, Jesus. God, forgive the Pharisee I see in me. God, forgive my preferences that are in me. And let me get back to what it's all about, and that it's all about you, Jesus. God, let my heart beat again. Let my heart worship you again. Let my heart be thankful. Let me come with thanksgiving and praise in my mouth, not slander and gossip, not what used to be. God, let me be a new wineskin where your new spirit can be poured out within me. God, let me be a conduit. God, let me be a vessel that just makes it all about you. God, let me identify with your sufferings. God, let me identify with what you came to do. God, may I carry the mind of Christ, transformed and renewed into your likeness and to your desires. God, forgive the Pharisee I see in me. If I were to be completely honest, I think I resonate a whole lot more with the Pharisees than I do with Jesus. In fact, the title of this message is titled, The Pharisee I See in Me, and how it can so easily creep up to where I am squelching Every time we do not celebrate with our brothers and sisters' victory, we have a pharisaical mindset. When our brother and sister have a breakthrough and we come and we hear it, and then we start playing in our mind how it's not real, how it's not true, that's a pharisaical religious spirit. We should be the first to stand up, applaud, say, let's go, brother, let's go, sister. I'm in this with you. Let's do this. Come on. When one of your brothers or sisters wins, we all win. We're a part of that victory. We're with them on that. You see, Jesus loves to find broken people and heal them, but we see the flip side of this text where religious people love to guard their preferences and they completely miss out on the presence of God. And your third and final point today is this, is religious people care way more about what man thinks of them than what God thinks. Religious people care way more about what man thinks than what God thinks. You see this played out in the text pick up your mat and walk. So they, the religious leaders asked him, so who is this fellow that told you to pick it up and walk? The guy didn't know. Jesus slipped away. It says that the man who was, who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Verse 14, later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. In verse 15, the man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. And then verse 16, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. From this moment right here in John chapter 5 is the very moment that the religious leaders begin to persecute Jesus for the remaining chapters of John. This right here starts the death and resurrection of Jesus. Persecution only picks up from John 5 on. And right here, can you imagine this? I don't know how you would be. 38 years you've been unable to move, been hoping for a miracle, hoping to get in the pool. You're excommunicated from society. You can't go in the temple. You can't be a normal human being. And then someone comes along and restores your value, restores your dignity, restores you to being someone in society. Don't you think if you found that person again, you'd want to go to them and be like, thank you so much. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for setting me free. I've seen my family again. My life is restored. I want to follow you and I want to worship you. This right here is one of the saddest stories in all of Scripture, and it happens to our life often. Rather than this man thanking Jesus and worshiping him, 
his very first thought is to go find the religious leaders who accused him and go tattletale and stab Jesus in the back. Why? Because he was more concerned with what religious leaders thought of him than the savior of the world. Like this man meets mercy. Do you realize Bethesda, the pool of Bethesda where this miracle happened? Bet meaning house. Bethesda, it's the house of mercy. Jesus demonstrates mercy to this man in the first time of his life, and then he backstabs the mercy he freely received. And some of you might be sitting there being like, what a joke. Why would a guy do that? His life's transformed. But you and I are guilty of the very same thing. How many of times have we come to church and we worship God and we love him, and then the very next day, it's like we're back to the same old life, same old, same old. You want to know what's so beautiful about the gospel? What's so beautiful about the gospel is that Jesus chose to love people knowing full well he'd be betrayed, backstabbed, hurt, mutilated. That right there is love. I have one question for every person in the room today. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Here's what I mean by that. It can mean multiple things. One, you're a away from Jesus, you're not following him, you don't even know him, maybe you're like the man for 38 years, you didn't know there was a God who loved you to come and get you, and even reveal his mercy to you, and today, your being well is him saving you, forgiving you of your sins, transforming you, but maybe there's another kind of person in the room where you want to get well, and it's this, you've allowed the religious system of today to be your God, and you every day live in shame, you live in regret, and you live in pain because you've never lived from the peace and perspective of the gospel. You've never truly had rest over your soul because you see the inadequacies in your life and you see the sin in your life and you don't feel worthy of his grace and his love. And in turn, you get driven into a people-pleasing mentality, pleasing religious leaders, pleasing people that you come in contact with, Grace sets you free from the approval of man. And grace allows you to be affirmed by the one that made you and created you, where you now live from a perspective of rest rather than trying to go and get rest. Your identity shifts, your identity changes. Do you want to get well? Because Christ is that, will be that, and do that for you. And maybe there's another person in the room where it's hard for you to be joyful. In fact, it's more easy for you to be critical than it is thankful because the religious spirit that's in you and on you, and it's squelching the presence of God in your life. Do you want to get well? Do you want to be healed? And then the last group is there's people who have a physical condition in the room where you have never been able to get well from it, it's been a part of your life like this man for 38 years. Jesus is saying, do you want to get well? There's someone in the room today that has colon issues. It's impacted, uh, maybe even been di diagnosed with Crohn's disease and you've been medication on it. There's also people in here where you've not been able to get pregnant. You're struggling with infertility. Um, there's people in here where uh, you have a hip, something wrong with your hip, a hip issue. Um, these are things I feel like the Holy Spirit just specifically showed me before today's service. Holy Spirit, show me areas in people's bodies that you want to deliver and be free and healed in Jesus' name. I don't want to pray, God, direct the surgeon's hands. I want to pray, God, do it right now. Heal him right now. Do it right now in Jesus' name. Finish it right now. Do you want to get well? He still asks it today. Maybe you came in from all over the place, different areas, spaces and places, backgrounds, and you didn't know Christ was gonna show up and find you maybe again or for the first time today. I want everyone to bow their head, close their eyes. I wanna ask you a question. Jesus didn't just come to momentarily heal you. Jesus came to make himself home inside of you, to live with you, to walk with you, to speak to you, to disciple you, to heal you, to cleanse you. 
but to you as a person to be someone that follows him. If you're here today and you're saying, Micah, I want to get well. I'm not following him. I've never followed him. I've never let him into my life. Don't really care about him, but today I want to give my life to him and surrender to him. Then I want you to put up your hand wherever you are. Just slip it up saying, hey, I want to get well. I want to come back to Christ. I want to give my life to Christ. Praise God. Anybody else? Awesome. Praise God. Praise God. Cool. Awesome. About eight hands, eight or nine hands just went up to say, hey, I want that. And what I love about the Father is the minute he sees one of his children turn their hearts, he starts running to them. He starts running to them. And he gives you his best. He gives you his goodness for your brokenness. He exchanges it. God, I thank you for the nine people that this morning are saying, God, I'm back. I'm coming back. God, you met me. You found me again. Help me to follow you, God, all the days of my life. Another question I have for you, do you want to get well for the people in the room where you walk in shame, you walk in guilt, or you've walked in physical bondage, like your back's jacked up, your body's messed up, you have cancer, whatever it might be, and you need a miracle. You need a breakthrough, one where God shows up and does what only he can do. I just want you to put up your hand wherever you are. Need something physically. Maybe it's infertility. Maybe it's the Crohn's or the colon, what I talked about today. Praise God. Awesome. There's about 80 or 90 people with their hands raised. In a little bit, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask everyone to stand. Not right now, but in a little bit, I'm going to ask you to stand. And then for those who need healing or want to get well or you respond to one of those, I'm going to ask you to come forward in a little bit. I'm going to ask if the church can come forward, not just a special group of people, but the whole church coming forward with these people that want to get well. Because if we're all honest, we all want to be well. We all want to get well. We all need Jesus. We all need his spirit. So if the church could stand, if you could meet me down front the best you can, the people that responded, the rest of us coming together as a church body, I want to pray over you today.